Thank you for taking the time to watch our short pre-recorded presentation. My name is Mark Turin, and I'm speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam-speaking Musqueam people in what is currently known as Vancouver in the strangely named province of British Columbia, Canada. Together with my colleagues, Christine Schreier and Julia Schillow, I'll be sharing a little bit about our work on the relational lexicography project and specifically about a survey that we are undertaking to learn more about how people actually make and also use dictionaries and to what end. Our presentation has three parts. I'll start by offering a little context and background to the relational lexicography project. Christine will then discuss the goals and the structure of our online survey and Julia We'll then share some of the trends and highlights from the preliminary survey results. Christine will then conclude the presentation with a short reflection. Relational lexicography is a three-year collaborative research project which is exploring new frameworks for community-informed dictionary work. We come to this from an appreciation of the power and importance of dictionaries. For under-resourced and indigenous communities, a dictionary contains crucial historical, cultural, and territorial information. And when languages become endangered, dictionaries become primary tools for language learning. In language communities that have very few written records, dictionary making can also be very time-consuming and labor-intensive. We understand the goals of relational lexicography to emerge out of more traditional dictionary making practices in which traditional lexicography was established by speakers of dominant languages and for those languages themselves. Our project is working to develop approaches to dictionary making that are rather more focused on the needs of under resourced languages and communities. Which brings us to the question, what is relational lexicography? Well, our working definition is as follows. We see our work as representing a shift towards recognizing and resourcing dictionaries that are created by speakers and with learners of under-resourced languages. And we have three intersecting high-level project goals. The first is to make theoretical and practical contributions to the work of language which revitalization and reclamation. Second, we're going to produce an open access framework and a toolkit of reference materials and resources that can be used by anyone to undertake more relationally engaged dictionary work. And finally, we're working to encourage the field of more traditional lexicography to embrace new audiences beyond the academy. We are a multi-sited, and quite collaborative group of people with different backgrounds and different affiliations. Projects like ours have lots of moving parts and the strength of our project are the partnerships, along with faculty members, student research assistants and colleagues in the library system, specialized in collections management and the development of open educational resources. We are very fortunate to work in close partnership with two First Nations communities, Splatine, and the Selkirk First Nations, both of whom are engaged in their own dictionary work and they're eager to see how what they're doing aligns with our goals. Three of our team members are giving a presentation about our open access knowledge base in the ICLDC this year, which we encourage and invite you to listen to as well. We're grateful to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for providing the core funding for our research project, as well as for additional funding and administrative support from various units and institutes on both campuses of our university in Vancouver and also in the Okanagan. And with that, I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Christine. Christine. Thank you, Mark. Well, Mark has provided an overview of our wider project and the reasons why we are focused on community-based dictionaries. In my section, I will discuss the development of our online survey, which asks people about their experiences making and using community-based dictionaries for Indigenous languages and other historically marginalized languages. Our survey begins with a land acknowledgement of the territories where we conduct our research. 
And in order to participate, individuals are required to be 18 years of age, read and understand English, and have participated in a community-based dictionary project even as a user rather than as a dictionary creator. If you are interested in completing the survey yourself, you can find it at dictionaries.arts.ubc.ca backslash survey backslash. Next slide, please. In our consent form, we describe the purpose of our survey in the following way. We want to learn about how people are constructing dictionaries. The information obtained will provide insights, valuable insight about the types of community informed dictionaries, as well as the types of resources, tools and practice participants think would be useful for them or others in their dictionary projects. Next slide, please. As you can see here, if individuals have been involved in more than one dictionary project, we encourage them to respond to the survey more than once, as each dictionary project is unique. We are still collecting responses and our discussion of preliminary results today is focused on our first 50 replies. We now have 98 responses completed with eight in progress. After asking, oh, next slide please. After asking participants to briefly describe the dictionary project, we asked them to identify their role in the project, such as community member, elder, learner, etc., and then to provide us with a few details about their responsibilities. Next slide, please. We asked participants to identify the type of dictionary, bilingual, picture, pocket, as well as if it is multilingual, and if so, what other languages, particularly dominant languages, are included. We are also curious about the various formats of community-based dictionaries, such as print dictionaries, apps, and online, online downloadable dictionaries. From our own experiences working on community-based dictionaries, we have often found them to be associated with other projects, such as wider language documentation and revitalization projects, archives, or exhibits. And so we ask participants about this as well. Next slide, please. Much of our survey has focused on the actual technologies and methods used for dictionary creation, as one of the goals of this project is a toolkit for dictionary makers that provides information and reviews all in one spot on the wide range of technical tools and resources individuals have used to develop community-based dictionaries. Individuals can choose from a range of tools and software, such as Fieldworks, First Voices, or Telex, and in particular, we wanted to know what the participants liked about these tools, but also any difficulties or frustrations users have with them. We also ask if the participants have received training and if they felt the training was adequate and what other types of information they would have liked to know. These details will help us fill in the blanks and seek ways to improve training or make recommendations as needed to future dictionary makers. Next slide, please. We also ask if participants have used any paper-based tools such as note cards, journals, et cetera, as we have found that in our own processes, information is often placed on paper ahead of being added to computers. Finally, one of the most important questions we ask participants is what challenges they have faced during their project. Making sure participants are aware they do not need to limit their replies to one challenge, since in our experience, the challenges are multiple. The challenges participants can choose from in the survey include funding, dialectical variation, technology, and sustainability, as well as others you can see here. Individuals are then asked to describe these in more detail and how they have overcome the challenges. However, in order to end on a positive note, we also ask what their greatest successes and outcomes have been. Next slide, please. As we would like this overall project to be representative of the collective work of dictionary makers and their knowledge and experience, we end our survey by asking participants if they would like to be acknowledged in our final research reports and how they would like to be acknowledged, their names and pronouns. Participants can then decide if they would like to be entered into a draw for a book about dictionary making in case you audience members would like another incentive to contribute to our project. And a reminder, you can find the survey here. Uh, at the link provided. I now turn it over to Julia, who will provide some of our preliminary analysis of the results of the survey from our first 50 participants. 
Thank you, Christine. I'll begin our analysis of the initial survey results with an overview of results which will inform the data presented on the following slides. Out of the initial 50 survey responses that we received, 11 were incomplete as they had either no questions answered or, the only, or only the initial questions asking for informed consent and confirmation of age were answered and thus contained no information pertinent to dictionary work. Four survey responses were for lexicographical work for conlangs or constructed languages, which are consciously devised, such as the Elvis, Elvish languages developed for the Lord of the Rings. We collected responses pertaining to lexicography for conlangs, as the methodology used when developing these dictionaries differs from that of dominant languages and can involve creative innovations for small capacity work. While these results provide interesting insights, they fall outside of the scope of the current presentation. Five survey results did not include any specification of which language they are for or do not uh, represent a dictionary compilation project specifically. So not including the survey responses that I just described, 30 responses remain, which cover dictionary projects for indigenous languages. 21 of these are for indigenous languages in North America, four for indigenous languages in Asia, three in Australia, and two in the Pacific Islands. For the remainder of the presentation, all of the following charts and calculations are reflective of these 30 responses related to dictionary projects for indigenous languages. Next slide, please. This chart shows the answers respondents gave when asked about their role in the dictionary project. Respondents are able to select multiple responses, so the percentage calculations reflect the number of respondents who selected each answer. Researcher was the most common answer, with 57% of respondents selecting this, followed by consultant, teacher, and research assistant, which were selected by 20% of respondents. Those who answered researcher were prompted to list their discipline. The most represented disciplines were anthropology, linguistics, and computer sciences. Five respondents indicated that they are community members, indicating that 25 respondents are non-community members. Next slide, please. We next examined the results to understand whether there were major differences in the answers provided by community members compared to non-community members. The most popular answer for community members is teacher which was selected by all five community members. The most popular answer for non-community members was researcher, which was selected by 64% of non-community members. All community members listed themselves as having multiple roles, while only four non-community members listed themselves as having more than one role. Next slide, please. This chart shows how respondents uh, answered the question uh, about what types of dictionary their project produced or is producing. The most common answer is bilingual dictionary, which 80% of respondents chose, while dialectal and pedagogical dictionaries, were, which were each selected by 27% of respondents, uh, were next. Again, respondents could select more than one answer. Next slide, please. Some trends appear in the data when separated by region, keeping in mind that we have a much larger sample size of dictionaries for North American indigenous languages. Dictionaries which make use of more than two languages are more common in non-English dominant countries. With all of the dictionaries from the Pacific Islands, island responses, trilingual, and one trilingual and one sexolingual dictionary for Asian languages out of a total of four dictionaries. In comparison, all of the Australian dictionaries are bilingual and only one of and only one North American dictionary is trilingual, while the remaining 20 are bilingual. Next slide, please. Picture dictionaries seem to be more popular in Asia, where three out of the four dictionaries are picture dictionaries. Next slide, please. Five out of the six talking dictionaries are found in North America. Similarly, verb dictionaries seem to be more popular in North America, where six out of the seven are found. However, respondents co-selected both noun and verb dictionaries um, twice, which could indicate that these categories were misunderstood. Next slide, please. Print dictionaries are the most common format, representing 63% representing of respondents, followed by online searchable dictionaries representing 43% of respondents. 
However, most respondents indicated that their dictionaries come in multiple formats, most often with both a print and online version. Next slide, please. 14 respondents indicated that their dictionaries only have one format. When this was the case, the most common format is a print dictionary, which represented six out of the 14. Those who marked other were asked to provide more detail. Their answers were digital searchable, uh, downloadable verb conjugators, online interactive activities, and audio recordings and transcribed text with glossaries. Next slide, please. This chart shows the answers respondents selected relating to challenges they faced in their dictionary projects. The most common answers are funding and personnel, which were selected by 41% of respondents, followed by technology, which was a challenge encountered by 39% of respondents. Overall, most respondents listed multiple challenges, with an average of 3.6 selected answers per respondent, and only five respondents who selected only one answer, of whom only one answered that they experienced no challenges. No trends emerged when comparing community members to non-community members or in a regional comparison. I will now turn back to Christine for some final remarks. Thank you, Julia. As you can see from Julia's comments, we already have multiple insights into the process of dictionary making, the types of dictionaries that are common in community-based dictionary projects, as well as who is involved. But we still have much work to do to analyze the rest of our results including more detailed analysis of the types of challenges people face, but also how they have overcome those. As one participant replied, they have overcome their challenges through patience, dedication, imagination, hard work by and commitment of many people, creativity, serendipitous help, luck, question mark. Another participant commented that there are too many challenges they are still working on them, and some of it has, is simply about hard choices, focusing for now on a single dialect, sidestepping a political issue about orthography, asking one person who no longer has time to help to recommend another person who can help. Next slide, please. Finally, there are many positives. As one participant said, we have a dictionary, and it's still used 10 to 15 years later. I think many of us who've been involved in dictionary projects feel similarly. Last, one participant noted that academia is finally paying attention to dictionary making as a form of research, acknowledging the importance of long-term collaborative community-based research to be as important as peer-reviewed articles for tenure and promotion. We'd like, next slide please. We'd like to thank these individuals who are included in our first 50 responses and who indicated that they would like to be acknowledged. If you would like to know more about our relational lexicography project or would like to participate yourself, next slide please, you can contact us at our project email, visit our website, or even contact myself or Mark on Twitter. Thank you for listening and we look forward to discussing this topic and more at our question and answer session on March 4th.